um, folks went back and updated the uh, modeling exposure. Um, are you looking, is that the, yeah, that's the high intake one. Um, Trouble with mine seeing what. First source data is the third column. So those are from the biomonitoring data, those are the 99th percentiles. The Bursar data is the third column. And then it's just the, the ratio. So what we did, remember yesterday, the points of departures are based on no ALs um, from the discussion. Now some of those we've, you know, put in just sort of force numbers in. Um, so some have better quality than others. But it's just the ratio of the point of departure to the corresponding high estimates from the two different approaches. And so you see those in the last two columns. And much to my surprise, there was a vast difference. Much the, in this case, in this is the only case in which the modeling was significantly lower than the biomonitoring data, which could mean that we're missing roots of exposure means there's not enough data out there to make an estimate and that what we're looking at here is that um, for now the different routes of exposure are going to have to catch up in terms of concentration data to see whether or not how, how to account for this difference. Well, I'm, I'm curious too because these numbers are actually smaller than what the medians were yesterday. Yeah, I know. So I'm not sure what he's done that's different. Um, I, he took out some, remember he had those two columns where, you know, he had the ones where he had real data and he had, you know, fractional data. I think what he did is took out all the fractional data for these, for these two and that's why. Um, and there was one, there were a couple of studies in which there was not enough data points to make an estimate. So he, um, he made some adjustments. Basically it shows there's no data. That's what this so, is showing. But the DNOP dropped like five orders of magnitude from yesterday. That's right. I think the D, DNOP and DINP and D, IDP are relatively, I think they're more data poor. And so if he took out a couple of, uh, you know, studies where the data were um, outliers, that would make a big difference. Right. And I think that's what he did because he realized it's just not enough data. Another hint that especially DINP might be data poor is that the exposure profile, the pie chart for DEHP looks totally different than for DINP and I would suspect that the exposure routes for DEHP would be rather similar for DHP and DINP and uh, I think we had a look at the raw data yesterday shortly and uh, that's where he showed that there was literally no data on DINP in foodstuff, for example, or so he couldn't capture these routes. So that would explain why. Yeah, and it, it's partly because the data are, the food data are old, right. mostly old data, and also not people, you know, a lot of times don't always look for D, or didn't always look for DI. It's mm -hmm. like with the PVDEs, they mm -hmm. didn't look for DECA, partly because it was harder to do, um, I mean, I'm not sure what the technical reasons were, but um, it, it can give you a false impression. So the fact that we've got all the two sets together on, on this table, I think we really need to have a strong footnote. I mean, I guess we should still include it in the same table, yeah. those three values, but they need to be strongly footnoted. Again, it goes back to the, in, in essence, it goes back to the points we made about some of the toxicological weaknesses where more data is needed because there is a deficiency. The only difference is, is at least there's some biomonitoring data to give us some degree of confidence as to where the margin of exposure may sit. So, at least for pregnant women, so therefore at least we have some, at least we're in this, the right ballpark. We just are not sure 
how many players are going to be on the field. But on the other side, the ones that we have more data-rich exposure modeling cases, that's remarkable agreement between the that's, biomonitoring that's and that. And this was the absolute worst case, right? Right. Um, for the high intake estimates. And that's why we think we're just data poor, because if it was, if there was an inconsistency among all of them, then we'd have a bit of a problem looking for, you know, associations or, or even identifying whether or not what's the reason for this dichotomy. But we're just looking at data poor situation. And there's a good recommendation for these chemicals. Paul, would you again update me on, on the data you used for the external exposure models? Did you only use data from the American market? Or was it uh, all literature data from all over the world? I think it was. Well, the, the priority um, the was to use uh, North data from North America in the last 10 years right. or this century if it were available. Right. But in many, you know, the most of the food data is from Canada in the, it might have been the, it was the 90s, 90s. I guess. Yep. Um, and in some cases, you know, all we have is Europe, because there's a l more data and more recent data from Europe than there is from yeah. from here. So, uh, you know, in some cases, there it's all we have is the European data, and that's going to be important for, uh, for example, the, in the children's scenarios, because mm -hmm. the baby formula in the milk, uh, there aren't a lot of. U, uh, North America or U.S. data. Yeah. The reason I'm asking for, uh, I ask that is because for dibutyl phthalate, for example, your model shows about tenfold higher values. And these values kind of more reflect the European situation. So in, in Europe, we have higher dibutyl phthalate values. Mm -hmm. But also because I think, well, I'm trying to remember, um, I think it's dibutyl, maybe I'm thinking diethyl, but the, the, the manufacturing, it's changing in the, the biomonitoring data are probably more current or more up to date than, than the other data. I just want to say it, everything is very plausible here in the end. You can, you can explain most of the things really by either lack of data or... And that also bodes well for some of the recommendations we have to make. Yeah, so. and, and I put together a matrix, taking Serge's spreadsheets, I put together a matrix to see, you know, which pathways had data on which chemicals. So when there's a gap, I mean, cosmetics, we didn't, don't expect to see DI and PDAHP, so that's okay. But for when you look at food and you don't, mm -hmm. if you're missing that data, then that says maybe you have to go back and, well, geez, because they weren't looking for it. They were only measuring, you know, certain phthalates. I think we're okay. I knocked this together quickly in the break, so um, the uh, wording is not perfect, and but but uh, hopefully we it, it will be a basis. So um, the INP, first of all, adversity. Um, we've heard there are three well-conducted um, experimental studies on this. Um, they more or less there are d differences in det detail, but. Um, they more or less are quite compatible with each other con considering that they were conducted in different labs using uh, uh, different rat strains. So we see um, really see we see uh, suppressions of fetal uh, testosterone production and changes in angel distance um, 
in, in all of these. The Kluwel study, admittedly, um, only at a later time point. And uh, one study, the Bobag, uh, observed retained nipples. The doses required to elicit those effects are in the range of uh, 750 milligram per kilogram or higher. Um, that, these are, I would say, the three, three decisive and three de important studies. Um, the human evidence, uh, there's no epidemiological evidence available to, as far as I know, to um, say anything really about the INP. I'm not so sure. Was this measured in the in China Swan study? I, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Yeah. No, because no, okay. of the time of when it was done. I think it was not evaluated, but I think we have the data of the INP for our model. But yes, yeah, so at the time, 2003 or four, when the, the measurements were done, it was not included as, no, but I guess, later. We have the data. And oh, it has, you've measured it. We have it in the model. It's in the, um, what, model? what is it called, the SFF, the, the um, Study of future, future families. families. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The data are there, but it's less observations, like in some cases only 18 subjects. So, so in other words, emerging. an epidemiological, a proper epidemiological evaluation of this is not available currently. Yeah? yeah? Correct. In, in relation to AGD. <laughs> in relation to other things? Um, other things in the developmental reproductive realm or... or there, no. I mean, uh, it hasn't been measured. It's being measured now in epidemiologic mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. But I think samples, because it's kind of come online in the last year or so, let's say, there's not enough data points yet for association studies. Yes, I think with the doses required, I would put it are in the range of 250. That's what uh, we have seen in the... So did you based this assumption on the Boberg and Hanna study, or? Yeah, this, this you see, I've, I've okay. knocked this up roughly. I mean, this has to be detailed, detail, uh, investigated in detail. But what I'm trying to say is that this clearly is one of the, the less potent phthalates we know of. And I, I will modify this for you. OK. Right, the next one, human relevance. Uh, the effects indicative of androgen uh, insufficiency in, uh, well, these are indicative of androgen insufficiency in fetal life in the rat. And these are currently generally to be judged to be relevant to the human. Uh, we heard some evidence on Monday that would uh, cast some doubt onto that, some doubt, but. Uh, the payoff or uh, the trade-off would be that uh, what we heard on Monday, no, on Tuesday it was, um, would um, highlight the importance of neonatal exposures more. So it's uh, swings and roundabouts, I guess. I, I would say uh, that we, well, in the uh, absence of evidence to the contrary, I, I would judge this as relevant to, to the human. The weight of evidence. Uh, if we look at the Klimisch scores, um, I think these studies can be judged to be reliable without restriction. Uh, although, while well, the Boberg lab works uh, not, they, they work uh, according to GL's, uh, GLP standards, although they, they are a university now, they are, they are not they are not operated, but these are GLP-like standards, and I guess uh, that is also fulfilled with the Kluwel study. Um, the um, Earl Grace lab, um, I don't know, but I think that's, that's no doubt. Technical quality, we have uh, fairly large studies there. Uh, sufficient numbers of doses and animals per dose groups were included, uh, in my opinion, sufficient enough uh, to base estimations of points of departures on that. And. Uh, we have to mention here that we uh, have here a replication by three independent labs using slightly different rat strains, but the effects are amazingly um, uh, concordant. Yeah. Andreas, to follow our own criteria, I would suggest to put an asterisk to the three independent labs because only two of the studies have been published and peer reviewed, while the Kluwel study has not been published and peer-reviewed yet, so it was just the presentation from yesterday. Is it, is it 
published, just to follow our criteria. Mm, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. That's a good point, yeah. I don't know, maybe, I, I guess, I would expect that uh, during the lifetime of the work of this committee, this study will appear in the literature. I hope. Okay, shall we do next? Risk assessment consideration. So first of all, exposure. Um, based on biomonitoring, uh, we, we're dealing with high exposures uh, of, of around 27 microgram per kilogram a day. That's uh, directly lifted from Chris's table, which we just saw a minute ago. Um, B, hazard uh, considerations, points of departure. Uh, points of departures have been estimated to be 50 milligram per kilogram per day. I think that is uh, with suppression of testosterone synthesis as, as an end point. And I think that is from uh, an experiment with sufficient numbers of animals. Is that correct? That's data from the Lewell study, I think. Maybe that ca could be refined uh, by, by benchmark dose okay. consideration. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, her, her no AL was 50. Um, now, I don't, I don't know. If they're, they're, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it may also be similar to one of the other studies. but Posterone and germ cell germ cell um, morphological changes. Yeah. So then uh, uh, taking on board what, what is in Chris's table, the mode, uh, sorry, the margin of exposure, uh, looking at high exposures, which we have to do now, we have to do uh, base this on, on reasonably worst case assumptions. Uh, the margin of exposure is uh, 1800 and uh, one could argue and there's a precedent in the literature for arguing along those lines that in uh, consideration of the severity uh, of potential risks uh, you would want an MOE in the ballpark of, of 1000. Um, so this would be, you know, you have to have only a doubling in exposures to reach that, that gray zone. Um, the consideration that drives this now is that DNP is slated to replace DEHP, with which the concern now is that this will reduce the margin of exposure further. Then move on. On the basis of that, uh, the recommendation would be, so in in view of the present MOE and the anticipated reduction of this MOE for, f for future use patterns, as well as the potential gravity of effects for children, it is recommended to implement a permanent ban on DINP in children's toys and care products. This could be worded better, I know, but that's, the, that's a suggestion which we need to discuss, or we discussed it yesterday already. And will this be expected to reduce exposure to children? Um, I do not know, but the experts can quickly say that. Wise to say something, Mike? Should we say something? Should we discuss about exposure? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I think of it as it, as a conditional. If you, I mean, right now because of the interim ban, um, all you're doing is maintaining the status quo. So that in itself is not going to change the exposure. But if you consider the alternative of allowing it, then of course it would. Yes, that that's. I think that's a terribly important point. We have to consider here what the con consequences would be of. Moving the band. removing the restrictions. With the restrictions, what's our what's our uh, number again? Was it eighteen hundred? With restrictions, the levels that we're seeing in in the people children in the population pregnant women are such that we still have a um, 
an exposure unit of 1,800, and that's with an interim ban. That's based on the monitoring high intakes, which was 2005-06 data. Well, the the ban went into effect. I mean, you're talking about toys and child care articles. It went into effect in 09, February 09, I think. Important point. I mean, it, there is no ban in terms of personal care products. Right. So the right. I mean, there. I don't think there's DINP in personal care products or, or not the, much. But I mean, it's 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 used in other. Yeah. There's no the nothing for other products. So the sources for pregnant women probably haven't changed or may not have changed. Who knows? Correct. <laughs> mm -hmm. They probably haven't. Well, if anything, they. You know, we. You could speculate if DINP is replacing DEHP, they might have actually gone up over time. But I'm, I'm wondering, um, because we're doing this uh, in the context of we're looking at both individual cumulative risk, DINP is one of those where the other endpoints probably are, are probably more sensitive than the, the antiandrogenic effects. And I think we need to make it clear so people, you know, don't look at this and say, you know, read this as the POD is 50 for everything. It, it's 50 for these effects. Have a, do, do we have a lower POD for other effects? Mike, my feeling is that with this POD, we might be lower than for the other effects. Well, I mean, it, it, it depends on who. Uh, I, I would say the POD for the other effects is about 15, but depends on who you do. But that's uh, maybe even more true for DEP and DMP. I don't know. In the, in the write-up here, and Andres, you did a super job in such a short limit. But should there be, in, instead of just the statement of the POD, some sort of evaluation of the quality of that? I mean, so from the previous discussion, we departure don't have a confidence interval. <laughs> you know, it's it's based on. Points or whatever, some kind of a qualitative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, longer? Oh. Mostly. Okay. Do we need this here? Because I think we already did the discussion in, for the talk studies on the other on the slide before. Yeah. I don't think we need it here. But uh, the question I have. Okay, go ahead. No. Continue. But my point was, though, that, you know, chosen a point of departure based on something. Mm -hmm. It didn't just come out of the air, and it needs to be how solid we think that point of departure is from the earlier studies. Um, and if there, are, if that point of departure could actually be reduced if other endpoints are considered, then that's the kind of evaluation that would be helpful at that point. But, but then again, that would be swings and rounds. But Mike t just informs me that there are lower p PODs for, for liver effects. But for these, probably you wouldn't demand such a high margin of exposure. True. Uh, so the, they would cancel, yeah. but it's just yeah. uh, I, I, I was just thinking, you know, we're looking at this as a single piece, and I'm trying to look at it, you know, what's the context? We just, I just want that to be clear. I guess the question that remains in my mind is you focus on 27, but all the other data is so much lower. Our calculations, Bursar's calculation. So w there's a dichotomy. There's a factor of ten differential. Is that because of lack of data, or? Yeah. I think that's the important point. We have to go back to the Bursar data and check if there is a considerable lack of data. And I think we yesterday went back to the data and saw for DINP that there is a considerable lack of data, yeah, which I, might I, explain these lower values. Yeah, I, 
I think think so. And, and the question becomes, you know, if if we have a ban now, twenty seven come from. That that was my question as well. Um, I Where think do I get from? this right? The the biomonitoring data this twenty seven is based on twenty seven microgram per kilogram per day, is from before the the interim ban came came into but effect. That's the, but that's the important point. I think what the interim ban is for toys. for toys. It's not Enough an interim ban for the products that ex yeah. have exposed the pregnant women. But my point is this: Do we have any data uh, post two thousand and nine to see? whether anything has changed? I don't think we do. No. 2005 and 6. 2005 and 6, the Versa data is whatever is available, and it's not going to be 2009, that's for sure. The Wormuth data is what, 2003? You mean uh, something earlier than that? Because the publication is 2006. The German data on the, the specimen bank data indicates that the uh, DINP, at least in Europe, is on the rise, and DEHP is on the fall. I think similar. If where do you get that data from? Where's where's that data available? Because saying it's on the rise, it means my base point is well taken. Where's the data to show that? Data on the German Environmental Specimen Bank that's uh, archived urine samples, and they have been analyzed until 2000. Nine, that's the last date, last data set. It's been published. And it has been published, yes. So comparison to Sharma Swan's data, um, that 27 is about two to three times higher than the data that she gave us in February. I guess, I'm not sure when that study began. When it began, I, th I think 2002 or three, or that's when those urine samples are from. But I'm not sure if there mm -hmm. were so additional all. ones that were collected later. I don't think so. If it was just from the pregnant women, then it would definitely be before 2004. Yeah. But but I think the key argument in any case, d d despite all the detail, is this. Uh, so this this product, sorry, this chemical is designed or slated to replace DEHP in the critical object we're talking about, children's toys, which can be moused, etc., etc. Probably not so much in cash, personal care products. But therefore, uh, the we're, we're, any recommendation saying, okay, the ban is irrelevant, can be released, da, 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 will lead to um, a rise in exposure, which will t probably take place anyway. Uh, there are doubts, I know, whether a, a, a ban in children's toys, etc., will have any effect on halting this uh, uncomfortable trend in exposures, but uh, I think, uh, judging against this general trend, it would uh, look rather weird if this panel would conclude, oh yeah, nothing to worry about, let's release, let's release the ban in, um, in toys. You know, the message should be, in my opinion, that, you know, something needs to be done to stem this rise in exposures. And uh, against that background, then to say nothing uh, should be done, no recommendation here, no action would seem rather, shall we say, incongruous. That's what I would argue is the main argument. <clears throat> Isn't part of our um purview also include um, products that would be used by pregnant women, not just toys? Yes. Is it? Yeah, it's right. Well, if you, it's, I mean, the, wor the wording's in tab 12, but it, it's, you're supposed to consider all of those things, um, and, mm -hmm. and I think what they're getting at is exposures to the mother. And that would include exposure to the kids' products. 
Um, although, uh, you know, how, mu how much is that going to contribute to the mom is, a, is another issue, but. You're not talking about uh, ex no, well, we're we're looking at total exposure to the mom, and I mean, including everything, including personal care products, and including the mom's exposure from the children's products, like the toys and so on. Um, the answer to your question is definitely yes. The, so the pregnant women could be, there are products that are not from the toys, but other things that pregnant women are using. That, is that part yeah, of the Yeah, definite, definitely. So, if we demand, if we're, if we're looking at, a, at this from the point of view of DINP being a band in children's toys, continuation of the band, or maybe becoming pertinent, per permanent. Are we then, by as a consequence, because of the fact that we're seeing these kinds of exposures, or at least these potential exposures in in pregnant women, based upon the data we saw, uh, are we by? Inference saying that should be banned there too, and somebody else should pick it up. I don't know whether that's within our remit, but uh, I would agree with your general concern. To me, that's more of a concern yeah. than the toys, yeah. because it's clear that <clears throat> you know the frequency and the behavior and the potential contacts are much greater for the pregnant woman and um, and as a consequence for fetal transfer um, and postnatal transfer so I would be more I'd be inclined to want to see if we're going to make a recommendation <laughs> we make a, a recommendation that you know hits the target well, I think our recommendations are directed to uh, uh, CPSC, and they, they, what they can do is limited, but, uh, so we can't make a formal recommendation about this, I would guess. But, but I Mike, thought that was Mike, in our charge. Uh, but we can make a note on that, noting this and flagging up uh, the need for perhaps regulatory action by other competent authorities. Like how, how could we handle it? Is, that, is there a way of handling that? Well, I mean, they're strong uh, enough without you can. I mean, obviously, there th you can recommend whatever you think should be recommended. Okay. Some of these are things that we that CPSC couldn't do, but you could, you know, however you want to word it, um, as a note, as a, a recommendation to the broader regulatory community, um, you know, that to to put everything in context text that this is only part of the problem and we can only address certain exposures that be done by by two things one adding another question at the end the, the sort of part that says something about exposure to, to children but then also adding something a parallel question to exposures to pregnant women but then answering those questions by going back into the exposure modeling data and those pie charts and saying yeah. It appears as if a primary, you know, 75% of exposures come from whatever. So it, it gives a very clear um, statement about what kinds of products would be very impactful in terms of. Sure. I, like that. I think that would be doing justice to the analysis. And, and I guess in terms of process, I mean, this is, these are the criteria for making these recommendations, but it's not the recommendation itself. Or the bottom, well, or it is, I, okay, and, and yeah, they certainly could be crafted in that way.
Would number, it, I guess uh, number five is the recommendation. Yeah, but and could could we simply add another sentence here to the effect of, for example, it, it, this may not be correct, but given that uh, DINP um, is found primarily in in food products, uh, we would also recommend that whatever. Yeah, and I think that you know that's consistent with like the silver book and you know people are getting away from these you know yes no answers and you know putting a little more of a narrative so that's great something Chris? but based on the poor data the poor lack of data or whatever for the DIMP would we be able Modeling, or are there such high? Uh, much. I can't say for certain what the price. But. But in other valleys, we could say something. Question there is, you know, if we're going to ban it, say, you know. Find the right sources and let it, and do the right data collection so that the ban is implemented in the right way so that um, exposure reduction occurs in both the woman and the fetus. Helping child. You know, I I think we will be able to estimate a child's exposure from toys. Yeah, I think that's true, and by by virtue of analogy showing it so low that anything else that occur would have to be, you know, come from the mother. Initially, no, until some data collection was. That could be part of our recommendation, though, in order mm -hmm. to actually nail down. I can provide some words for that. Okay. Now? Now. All right. Um, let me see if I can get my head straight. Uh, in consideration of a ban, either permanent or um, maintaining interim, it's clear that um, there are exposures to pregnant women but that we Ooh, don't know. I, I'm a hunt and peck. Oh, okay. All right. Well, in consideration of a ban, I can sit here now for hours and think my words out really well. <laughs> consideration of a ban. Okay. Um, there are high exposures noted or documented for there pregnant are women. High exposures documented for pregnant women. Period. Thus. In addition to consideration of banning DINP children's toys. Wait, I'm back up. There are high exposures to pregnant women. <laughs> <laughs> write it down, man. <laughs> it's easier. All right. Think slower. Where are we now? <laughs> well, look up there. Man, there are high exposures to pregnant women. Um, listen, I had a really good idea, and now I screwed it, and they screwed it. But our, you know, we are only able to make recommendations about ban. However, hear that there will be transfer of 
Sky and P. Mother. Kiss or child. Salt. And. Products by pregnant woman. However, this can all well, this can only occur. Once the roots highest exposure characterized. That's long, but that's the essence of what we have to you know, whittle down to say. That meet with I can I can wordsmith that to right. Do but it, uh, am I missing anything, Chris? But largely, you're you're saying that the the exposure data now um, there's holes in the exposure yeah. data now. Yeah. So that that last sentence saying. Yeah. Right. Really well, I'm saying it in such a way so that they don't lose the thread of the argument. You have to look at the different routes of exposure to figure out where you want to make your bank. document if we have such a comment at the end of other um, little um, back to the exposure modeling then that'll be well that's going to be I mean this this will be derived this is basically an example of what we're going to say in the introduction saying it's a total exposure issue and the parents they understand the consequences of exposure to a child you have to understand the consequences you have to see, understand the relationship between mother and child and transfer of material but but we should say this kind of stuff particularly about uh, DVP and DEHP I think this is an important point and I think we've really I don't think people have necessarily understood that interaction when they're trying looked at it with lead we look at it with narcotics why haven't we looked at it with um, toxic chemicals crack babies transfer ever seen a crack baby you Paul, we might we might even add to that that we could say possibly neither a ban in child care products and toys and neither a ban in products for pregnant women might need lead to a significant reduction in exposure one more time again neither the ban in the child care products and the toys nor the ban in products for pregnant women might lead to a significant reduction in DINP exposure we don't know yet because we haven't done the analysis. I exactly. think that with further exposure categorization, we can probably find where. Because we've seen for DHP that the major route of exposure is direct or indirect ingestion. Right, right. That comes from mother's milk. Really until we have these characterized, we have an uncertainty. Uncertainty truly does, needs to be reduced. I think make the statement that you clearly Okay, 
Um, what I'd like to do next is uh, start the next ballot, and Holger's going to lead the discussion on DIDP, and Mike's going to type in the, the wording into the template. Uh, can, I, can I make a suggestion before some of us have to leave? I really think we need to know a little bit more about how we're going to approach the substitutes because we haven't really discussed that. with our conversations today and yesterday about, you know, not wanting to go from the frying pan into the fire, I think it's a real significant issue. I, I would support that, but uh, maybe without talking about substitutes itself, I mean, the, the problem is, is essentially uh, we should consider a phthalate where there's very little data available, so the substitutes would also fall into that category. And, uh, That's by fine. By looking at such an example, we can then uh, enunciate important principles and then see where that leads us. So mm -hmm. we should look at one of our phthalates, yeah. now, which is yeah. poor data, and use that yeah. by analogy. Yeah. Perfectly fine with me, because I think that will help us address this issue of the large uncertainties we're going to have with uh, substitutes. As we pointed out yesterday, we see this as a, as a kind of exercise. So we have yes. done the exercise for one sort of... For, for DINP now, I would really support going over to, let's say, DNOP or DIDP, for example. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is an exercise. This is not yet a decision. Right. Mm -hmm. I promise to prepare a slide for DIBP, and I will send it around as based on the discussions we led yesterday. But I think we should move on to the next exercise. Okay. It, just as long as we don't lose that thread, because I think we all were discussing that yesterday as being a major concern, and we, we have to um, deal with it at some point, and the sooner the better before a December meeting. Okay. I'm fine. Now I'm fine. Good group. On to so we still on. have we still have the two phthalates on preliminary ban. Mm -hmm. uh, could could we have this MOE table again? <laughs> MOE table. Could we have that again? Look at yes, we can. That's why I was going to go to the DIDP next. Okay. What we're doing, DIDP? DIDP. That seems like an easy one. <laughs> okay. Or you choose. Either one of them seem. Can we go for DIDP? Which one? DIDP. The DIDP. Yeah, we could, could should go that. through DIDP. It's, it has actually analogous almost to DNO. Similar types of uh, ranges. You put the, on the draft table too, or the, the draft for our considerations? Uh, fortunately, I don't. Well, I can give you something, but it's not. What I can give you is the the draft for DMP, which has information, but it has the five point, the six points. Is that okay? And Mike, are you prepared to take notes to yeah. fill? Okay, good, thanks. Well, uh, that would be even better. As long as you are working on the template. A document that has a first.
Tomek. Good, so we should should try to list the, the studies in animals that we can regard as relevant for us. And I think here, although we have the European Risk Assessment Report on DIDP, Mike, uh, I think we don't have much data here supporting Or finding effects on the androgen regulated pathway for DIDP. So that would be Burn and Phil again to jump in and tell us something about possible studies we might use. So you're saying it hasn't been tested in appropriate uh, uh, experiments? Or has it been tested and nothing came out? The IDP now. Just starting on the We're animal. looking to find the... Developmental? Yeah. There's, there's only one study. Um, large numbers of animals per dose. Um, they found a slight but significant increase in the age of prepucial separation um, at uh, 300 milligrams per kilogram per day, which would make a Noel of 150. In, their, in the paper, they didn't consider, although it was statistically significant, they didn't think it was biologically significant. So, make of that. I mean, again, it's, it's one of those endpoints that's part of the phthalate syndrome. Light, but statistically significant effect. One study, large number of animals per dose, large number of doses. But, but has dosing uh, taken place during the, the critical yes. period? Yes. Okay. GD1 and to PND21, so yes. Right. And have uh, those other endpoints, uh, AGD, nipple retention, et cetera, been evaluated and looked at? Yes. Or? No observed effects on AGD or nipple retention at I any know. dose. Okay. That's one of those studies where, yes, there was this slight effect. It's an endpoint that's looked for. One study, good study. Get to the weight of evidence, I think we'd have to make some comments. That's, that's their term. they say in their paper, a slight but significant. I don't know. I guess it could, it could mean, I mean, I don't know the animal literature or the terms that much, but, you know, let's say you were using this as a corollary of pubertal development in humans, you know, slight or small delay would be, you know, maybe delay of a month versus a clinical delay of 12 months in a child or two years, and probably in this case, right, they're, they're talking about delay in timing. Timing, yes. Yeah, so. For that, do you, from your experience, have a feel for what that might mean?
Is there a concern, I mean, uh, exactly. in terms of uh, read across, Holger, I think you might be able to understand this. Uh, it's diisodosyl phthalate. So do we have concerns uh, in terms of reading across uh, two phthalates with, with a similar chemical structure which, which have shown these effects, or can that be ruled out as well? You have to be aware that in some commercial preparations, a certain extent of DINP might be present in DIDP. As for DINP, there have been different... What ratio? DINP is higher, DIDP is lower, or what? Would have to check the details, but uh, some percentage of DIDP can be also, depending on the producer, uh, can have nine carbon atoms in the alkyl chain length, so we would be in the DINP region. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that, that would be dealt with under DINP. But right. we have here, we're dealing with a carbon side chain length of 10. Right. As far as I can see, that's, uh, I can detect no evidence from the literature that that would give rise to concern. Mm -hmm. Is this correct? That's my feeling, right. yeah. Well, except that it, it's, I don't think it's 10, I think it's mostly 10, 9 to 11, but mostly 10. And I'm not sure if, if that, uh, the uh, ECHO report, I thought didn't give a lot of details about the makeup like it did for DINP. For DINP, I know the numbers, but for DIDP, I don't know the numbers. But what you're saying right now is you're, it, the bar, you're not raising your eyebrows that much about it at this point as being a source of exposure. Mike, just to clarify, that is a, was a two-generation study. Mm-hmm. So is the potency low or high in your mind? Having in mind both the literature that has been compiled here in the report and the presentations from Earl Gray three meetings ago or four meetings ago, we might face the same issue like with DEP, so we are on the other tail end of, of uh, activity. So I would say, if at all, there would be small activity. Mm -hmm. And I think Earl, it, it's a two-gen study, and I think Earl would say that it might not have the statistical power to detect these subtle effects. If there were subtle effects, probably won't see them. So that's what I try to say. We are at, at the other side of the carbon chain length and the tail end of possible effects. I mean, not to mention the branching. Mm -hmm. Nipple retention, they also looked at um, vaginal patency. So we would have uh, minimal concerns there, is that correct? Would that be a fair summary? At least that's what I'm getting from this. What about the, the Exxon study? I th it's in here. Um, how do we deal with this one? Where is it? The IDP. I think it's on your part of the list, is it? <coughs> well, there are two other... <coughs> Who are the reproductive types? That's the IDP.
the DIDP, there was one Exxon study that was reported in the year 2000, a two-generation two reproductive study. Done in rats. Levels from about 400 to 800 milligrams per kilogram per day. No adverse reproductive effects were observed in either two generation study that they reported. Caused decreased weight gain and increased liver and kidney weights in the adults. So, no adverse reproductive mm -hmm. effects in the reproductive study that was. Efficiently designed, multiple doses, dose levels up to toxic, e non-reproductive toxic effects in the adults. Mike, is that the the, the publication that Hushka, wasn't? Hushka, which is uh, ex the Exxon Mobil study, I think. I think it's the same study. Is it? The trick is, can I find the appropriate tables? Right here. Yeah. Well, compared to the control, about a, a day. Control is 44.7. You have to take into account how many. That, that's also affected by how many times per day they looked. They looked once a day, then the intervals between yes and no is 24 hours. If they checked every three or four hours, it make, would make a big difference in how these data are interpreted. But there's no data out there looking at the endpoints we considered relevant, like testosterone reduction and germ cell modifications. I think, I mean, that maybe whoever writes this up has to back this up by detailed con <laughs> considerations, but for the purposes of our discussion here now, we can, uh, we can conclude that the criterion of adversity is not fulfilled. Yeah. Not that fulfilled. Not fulfilled. I would agree. Totally. I don't see about testosterone. Okay, okay, I, that's my fault then. I was um, assuming.
Okay, but, but if you have uh, this situation, I think that uh, warrants special attention now in terms of uh, the technical considerations, the weight of evidence. Whenever you have a, a, a toxicological study that uh, is a null, that doesn't produce any evidence for effects, you want to be very careful uh, to checking about the technical standard to safeguard against the fact that we're dealing with a false negative here. Mike, about the composition of DIDP. The DIDP used in the Exxon, respectively, the Hushka study, has it been, uh, did it contain C9 parts or was it purely C10? Could we check this? Um, I, I can see if the cast number's yeah. here. But I, I mean, I couldn't find, like with DINP, the cast number, depending on what that is, you, there's slight changes in the composition, but for DIDP, I couldn't find any information to that effect, to cast numbers. Obviously, one of our quality criteria and the weight of evidence has to be, uh, we forgot to say that, that uh, um, the purity, the chemical purity of the material tested has to be obtained. I know it sounds very trivial, but the, often it's... I'm looking for the... Well, yeah, well, it says two different cast numbers. You're trying to find which one they used in this study. I'm looking for the materials. But aren't we getting too detailed here? This is just trying out principles. I mean, the, uh, whoever writes this up, I think it's going to be Holger. You have to check these things in detail. There'll be for the purposes of our discussion. Uh, oh, here. It's, it's, I'm sorry. It says C9 to C11. You see my problems? Yeah. yeah, sure, I do, yeah. Well, where do we go from here? I definitely would like to know how much C9 has been in this EIDP. Uh, but for this document, it would then be fair to note these, these um, considerations, but yeah. It's not, it's not something that we're going to know at this time. And but I think it's something we should note, saying that, again, like with everything we want, transparency in this process, we need to know a little bit more about what's going on. Is there any other supporting evidence, anyone else who tested it? No. Is that the only study? To my knowledge, in Earl Grey's group, the different types of DIDP have been tested, but the results have not been published yet, Mike. Oh, okay, I wasn't clear on that, yeah. 
And I don't know how different the two types are. But whatever, I mean, whatever C9 is in there, it's, it's a small, I mean, you know, it's not a, I don't think it's a big fraction, but we don't really know. But I mean, our lab can certainly see, they might know, have some, a rough idea. I mean, they can tell the two kinds of DINP apart. They might know something about the DIDP. But had it been contaminated by a lot of C9, we, we would have expected to see uh, DINP-like effects, correct? Exactly. But the other way around would mean that if they used a DIDP low on DINP, can we use it? The study as relevant for DINP-rich DIDPs. I think one would then have to conclude in um, by referring to results with DINP that there's there's a concern for DINP-rich DIDPs. That was my thinking. But this doesn't anywhere because here now we are judging the qualities of the IDP. But we have to know to consider that some of the products on the market might or might not contain significant amounts of the IDP. I, I think that's an issue well beyond what our charge is right now. And I think it's something we can note. Again, like on anything else, we, we're, we're bringing up well, any, a lot of other things. We're bringing up other issues, but I think for the purpose of what we're doing right now, I think it's something that's not going to get us anywhere. Make a note right here in experimental design. Yeah, that we do not know the composition of the DD, DIDP and then, in terms of how much DINP there. Is. And we should note that this should be considered in the design of any future experiments. Yeah. Period. Yeah. So would the IDP products that contain significant amounts of DINP then fall under the proposed ban? Well, if it's significant amount of DINP, then it's DINP. IDP. But it's sold as DIDP, used as DIDP, but containing C9. Well, maybe we have to get people to understand that there's this is an issue that has to be resolved in turn if it's more than if the IDP is less than 50% of the material that's in there then it's a lie all right they're they're obfuscating at best what the true nature of the material is i think it's the c9 is probably well it, it, it it's also described, I mean, I think it's predominantly C10 or C10 rich, but I think the amount of C9 is probably not great. I also suspect that they could tell us. They probably sure. know. I think it's something to note. I think I'm not going to get worried about at this point because I, I think that it, I think that what Mike says is true. I think it's probably predominantly. But it's something to note just so that we don't get other products that are shipped in from other countries that may not have a labeling on it that's appropriate. I mean, another consideration is would be, Holger, and I don't know whether you would want to advocate this. Um, I mean, that would be a pragmatic, a practical consideration that uh, the, if, for example, is there concern that the DINP content of DIDP cannot be controlled, that for that reason we have concerns about DIDP? Not the product specialist, I don't know. I'm getting confused with that. Where were you ending up? Well, the IDP is currently interim banned. God knows why, but. <laughs> <laughs> I 
the issue is this, on the basis of the data available to us, there would be a, a consideration to say no justification for interim banning the IDP. Agreed. But Agreed. if there's concerns that the, the, the DINP, the C9 content of, of that Thank product you. cannot be controlled, then this would have to be judged in a different light, I would say. I think that's a very fair statement, and I think that, again, manufacturers would have to demonstrate that the majority of the material in there, if we are not going to de ban the IDP, it has to be demonstrated that the IDP is the majority of what's in a product and it's not DINP as a mask. That would be fine because then we can yeah. then we can say what we want that yeah. the IDP should not be banned. I, I guess that's the point here, isn't it? That's the point, yes. I think it's the point, yes. I agree, I agree with that point. Because we cannot propose a permanent ban on DINP, regard DIDP as not critical, and allow the major parts of DINP in DIDP. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So, again, it will have to be demonstrated that in toys that are in toys, that if you're using DIDP in toys, this is one where we get right to the heart of the matter, it has to be demonstrated that the material that's used is DIDP and not DIDP with a contamination of a lot of DINP. DINP. I mean, in that in, would work. In this piece of law, there there is a there is a concentration threshold specified. I think 0.5 percent, isn't it? So these bans, permanent or interim, only apply if the products contain more mm -hmm. than 0.5 percent. Yeah. So if you were to use the IDP, would you exceed that concentration level of the INP? I think that's the key, key question. So if, if the DINP content in the IDP would be 20%, we would, that this would be lead to a margin of 2% in the final product. We don't know. I, yeah, think, but it, I think the better way to phrase it is yeah. it has to be de demonstrated the, by the manufacturer that if you're going to be able to use DIDP, because we're not going to continue a ban on it, it has to be demonstrated that DINP is not a major component of that, pro of that, of that um, product by virtue of the fact that there's a range from 9 to 11. But that, that's the solution, I think. The, the, the use of DIDP in the product must not exceed the DINP concentration of 0.5%. Because DINP is banned. Work? Yeah, that, that would be logical, I think. Shall we therefore then recommend, as, as, as long as that is guaranteed, the interim ban on the IDP is not justified? Fine. I think yes. we can do that. Yeah. And, cool. I, and, and thanks for the very specific recommendation, and it's actually something concrete that manufacturers can actually be adhere to and demonstrate in their products. Correct? It's not fuzzy. But also, I mean, in testing, if they test right now, they test for DINP, and, and the, the cutoff's 0.1 percent. But the point, it's either above it or it's not. Mm -hmm. This was interesting. We would point out that we propose to lift the ban on the IDP, but also point out that uh, we still <coughs> we still have to keep the limit of 0.1, or is it 0.1? 0.1 percent. 1 percent for DINP. Okay. Less than 0.1 percent. That works. So does this mean then that the toxicology data that we talked about <coughs> Which led to a, a point of departure of, a, of 150,000. I mean, 150 uh, milligrams per kilogram is suspect, and so we can't mm -hmm. use that. Is that what we're getting to? No. So what? No. But why are you guys jumping so quickly to say that the margin of exposure is in a range that we're not interested in? I think it's dropping based, the band it, for it, it based, It's based upon the toxicology because of the potency of the material, and the, and basically that leads to the margin of exposure. Question. One least, the, and also the fact that there is little as material that we find. So, are we willing to say that a, a, the point of departure was 150 milligrams per kilogram? 
or is that suspect? Well, uh, I mean, again, we that's that's based on what's up there on the slide, and I think that's a very um, that's a very weak data on which to base a point of departure. So just in terms of process, are we saying because it's a weak date in terms of point of departure that we're not going to look at, mo at um, um, margin of exposure? Or are we going to go ahead and say? I, I think the margin of exposure in this case is not, is not the major issue. The major issue is points that were raised before about the potency. And the fact that if you want to look, put exposure into it, you know, even in pregnant women, the concentrations are relatively low. At the 95th percent, 99th percentile, while monitoring. I'm not, I'm not concerned about this at this point. With the proviso, and I think it's well articulated by both Andreas and Holger that it doesn't Exceed point. What is it? Point one percent. INP. Correct. I just want to make sure I'm right on on the numbers. The margins of exposure were pretty large, right? Yeah, they? they were very large. They were over a hundred thousand. I think we should complete that aspect number four, so we have that down. Yeah, I mean, it's, the margin of exposure is over a hundred thousand. So I, I'm not. You know, we're not talking about. A thousand. We're talking a hundred thousand. No, it's fifteen thousand. Well, we had two numbers. One was fifteen, and one was a hundred. Based on a, a, a lower quality evaluation of the modeling. Yeah, I know, but modeling but we're talking the modeling. You put them both together, and they're both high. You know, we're not talking about a hundred or a thousand. <clears throat> we're not in that range where I get nervous because Andreas got nervous. Officer, can I hold your hand? But the, oh. margin, but the margin of as long as it's not on TV, I guess. I mean, it's that's what we're doing. Crazy. It was covered by that. There's a there's another consideration as we look particularly at samples that were tested by the industry that manufactures it. It's easy to assume that what they tested is what they're making today, mm -hmm. and Often there are refinements in the process that change the composition of what's actually made and used today compared to what was tested at a very early stage, perhaps, of development of their method, of the process. True. So I don't know how, how good it is for us to assume that what's, what we're talking about recommendations for is actually what, I mean, what they tested isn't necessarily what, they're, what we're concerned about today. I think what we're, I think it's not necessarily what they tested. It's the point that the IDP seems to be having lower potency. At least that's the question. Our concern is, is the DIDP in current products or future products, if we're going to lift a ban, going to be contaminated enough with the INP to warrant a concern? Therefore, it's up to the manufacturers to demonstrate whether current methods or future methods of analysis are in play in these products or the material that are used in finally, finally distributing these products is, in actuality, have DINDP below 0.1. That is a, that's a fundamentally sound argument because it's all quantitative. There's no fuzziness there. But it implies that if it's a DIDP pure product, that that's okay. And that's my question, or do we feel comfortable about saying that? Holger, you're the one who presented it. That's, I think you're okay, right? We phrase it like that, then I think, I don't know, in my, in my thinking, we're, we're, on, we're okay because uh, if, if the IDP is too much con contaminated with the INP, then it's a problem. Then it will exceed the clause 
0.5% for DINP and will be caught like that, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? Yeah. That's right. I think we're on safe ground, Chris. I mean, even if you could purify DIDP, you would be okay. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know how much in control they have of pulling out DIDP from DINP. Depends on the alcohol mixture used. Right. How much clever engineering and chemistry are provided to the process. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the best, I think we've come up with a reasonable solution to this. I think we needed to make this distinction. Yes. For DINP and DIDP. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Herb. I have a <clears throat> separate question if, if we finish with that. But. So in the, in the recommendation, would you recommend more toxicology studies, or do you think this study is sufficient? Clearly, it's from a reputable source, isn't it? It's not a, I mean, it's just one study. It's not a chemical probably that would undergo further study. So if, if that's the recommendation, then probably the science will stop there with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was just asking, you know, in terms of the quality of the study, if you feel comfortable that one well-conducted null study is sufficient to, in terms of a recommendation for further research. I mean, that might be the, the limitation. This may not be important, but <clears throat> the, the study that we're referring to as the one we've been discussing is not really a developmental tox study, the two-generation reproductive study. So to answer the question of do we have enough information, we don't have any developmental tox data in a study that's designed specifically for that. And it may well be that if you were to design a study to evaluate the reproductive toxicity of this, because the dosing would be a shorter period of time, the dose levels might actually be higher. The maximum tolerated dose, the IDP might be higher in a developmental tox study than it was in a, in a longer exposure reproductive study. So I think the answer is we don't have a study for developmental tox assessment in the standard, standard protocol sense of it. And you would make that as a recommendation? We might make it as a recommendation, but it also comes, it also bears on the weight of evidence. There are no developmental tox studies. Mm -hmm. there, there, there is a reproductive study that was fairly well designed, but there are no developmental tox studies. But, but this, now it gets interesting. Would you, Bernie, would you think a development, a properly designed development clock study is necessary. The question that's behind that is would a, a developmental, would a study designed in the mode of a developmental toxicity study be more sensitive in detecting effects of DIDP than a study designed to look for similar effects, but if it's a reproductive study? I think the sensitivity in a developmental tox study might be a little bit greater. And get, keep in mind that this two-gen study was done in, in the feed. You would not do that mode of delivery in, in a developmental tox study. It would be an oral garbage exposure. In terms of, of Andreas's question, do you think a developmental tox study is necessary? I would add to that sentence, is it necessary to inform a recommendation or is it necessary for future research? Because there could be two components to that, right? Well, I'm, 
I'm bringing this up because of this. If we, if we say, from, on the basis of the evidence available to us, there is no further mm. concern about the IDP, uh, therefore we uh, can't mm. see a case for continuing an interim ban. If, if you then say, but we want further data on developmental tox, or properly de designed developmental tox data, you have lost the lever to get there. Mm -hmm. No one will do it. If, however, we say um, provisionally um, interim ban continued with a view of relaxing that, mm. provided we have a properly designed developmental tox study, that would sound a little different. Well, I think, first of all, we, we need to move the, what we have under developmental up to reproductive because technically that's not a developmental study. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's exposures during the developmental period, but it's not designed as a developmental tox study, as, as Byrne has, has said. Um, so we really don't have strictly a developmental tox study. And I think your point is well taken, that if, if that's something we judge to be necessary, then we need to take that into account in our recommendation. And also, we don't recommend that other studies would be done. We're basing all of the weight of evidence on one study, one laboratory, one test sample, and that's below the threshold for being able to make a firm statement. I mean, the, the reproductive study being fairly well designed reduces the probability of a surprise mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is, there's a, a big surprise waiting around the corner if we did that study. But if we're talking about how confident are we of allowing millions of children to use a product with this in there, I don't think this one study is, a, is above the threshold for being able to have a weight of evidence that gives us confidence. That, that's what I, I was asking, because, you know, thinking about it on the flip side with epidemiology, if you have a single epidemiologic study which, you know, seemed good, well designed, if it was positive, would it be enough to make a recommendation or if it was no? You, you probably wouldn't base it just on that. But I, I don't, you know, I haven't read this study, so I didn't know how, how well it was done or if, you know, what the other needs were for further research to, to replicate or expand. That's an example of how serious they were about this. They, they did a pilot study to pick dose levels for a preliminary two-generation reproductive study, which then was the basis for picking the dose levels for the final two-gen study. Uh, that's a pretty serious event to go through that that series. That, so they did it well, mm. but it's one strain of rat, one laboratory. The, the threshold that we work with is generally higher than mm. that, or we can make a firm statement. What would you rather do? I, I just can't see how we can continue the. I think what we could do is make a recommendation that the ban be lifted, but uh, only after more sufficient data is provided on another study. Is that what you want to do? I mean, that, that's not, the other option. I mean, that might be that might be the middle ground, saying that yeah, yeah. Right now, we need we need verification that we are leaning toward lifting the ban, but we need verification because one study is not sufficient. <coughs> I, can I ask uh, Holger um, about the, the, the um, physical chemical properties of that, of the IDP? Say, were the interim ban lifted, would, would we then have <coughs> wide application and wide use of this in, um, in children's toys? Well, mind you, the interim ban is presumably there for a reason, but one isn't so sure. No, no. I would say Mike is the better one to answer this question. Do you think the IDP might be? It, well, it might be. I don't know because there are other alternatives, but it's it would be a, a definite possibility. You know. You know what? This actually recommending another study would 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 provide us with two information pieces of information. One the study has to be designed in such a way that we know that it's the IDP. 
all right, getting back to the point of the matter that we're, what we're focusing on and not contaminated sufficiently <coughs> or into, with, with the INP, and then also provides a better weight of evidence for our decision. So we're leaning there, but we need a little bit more data, <coughs> and also it provides a way of <coughs> reducing this uncertainty about whether or not we're dealing with a pure compound or not. I think that pu pu puts us in a much, much firmer position in a final analysis but at least it shows that we're targeting toward that direction. We just need a little bit more data to, to firmly establish that. But I think we should be very clear that we want assurance that a DIDB, DIDP product is not a means of delivering exposure to DINP. Right. Yeah, that, that's one aspect, and second is uh, mm -hmm. following on what, what you also said, Bernie, uh, we would need a bit more assurance in a in a developmental tox study. Yeah. That's, so it's yeah. it's not just a replication. It's just just not yeah. simply more data. It's different data right. and different endpoints. And and even in the <clears throat> reproductive study, testosterone was not measured, right? So I mean, a recommendation potentially yeah. about you know, maybe a more uh, relevant sensitive endpoint. So it's it's so, not really so just replication. It's yeah. right. missing data. Yeah. So so recommendation is continuation of interim ban until provision of of these data. We should state that we're and evaluation of of the results. Right now we're leaning toward removal, but we cannot do it until we complete studies to verify what has been suggested. So I think I think it's a, a fair way of describing that. You know, in this particular case, go out and do the do go out and do the science. Move this ban. And if you can prove it, well, fine. If you can't, well, then the ban remains. Does that work for you, Andreas? I think we need to be careful not to promise that the ban will be relieved when you finish these studies. No, no, it has to be it's evaluated upon the results of the studies. Well, I think that's that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what we all mean. <laughs> so the first part of we're leaning towards would, would, would be strike. We, we wouldn't include that language, you know. Well, so it's, it would be, it's implied. It would be. It's implied. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the outcome. Of right. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Ask her or can see me. Yeah, before we leave, let's have it take a few minutes uh, and talk about the December meeting. Do you think it's really necessary? Because uh, I'm beginning to get second thoughts. It uh, it's places quite a heavy load on us uh, Europ Europeans. I, I don't know. I feel at the moment we're, we, we've got into the swing of things and made, made great progress. And mm -hmm. I, I, I also think that something like a telephone conference in December would be good. But do you really think we need to meet in December? I would add to that if if we didn't, what well, what would our alternative plan be? I mean, would we then have a meeting in early January or have one in February? Not 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 saying yes or or no in terms of whether we need it or not, but I mean, I think I can be convinced. You know, potentially a conference call, but then would our next meeting? I think it's when would that occur, and, and would that be? What would it entail? Yeah, just. As what would our alternative be? Well, if, if we if we stuck to the other part of, of our agreement, which was to have written materials in a week before the December meeting, um, if we stayed with that and had a conference call in lieu of the meeting, um, 
and then incorporated whatever we talk about in the conference call into that written material, resubmit uh, revised drafts of that, say, two, three weeks later, uh, we could then have a meeting, which would probably be a, could be a productive meeting in mid, I guess, January. Mid -February. Mid February or earlier. I would think that maybe right now it's the 15th of February. If we could move that up to the 7th or around that area would probably be better. Yeah, because we're bumping up against the March 1st. I would rather have, I think Andreas has got a good idea about having a conference call in December, but then your idea of making a little bit earlier for the meeting in, in February would probably be wiser. I think it would be more effective. Went with the plan B, we should, you know, maybe bef before Paul goes, try to find a date in early mm -hmm. February to mid-February. If we're going to go with the, you know, the conference call on the 19th and then. Mm -hmm. can, can we agree to make it after? It could be this, the, on the 16th of February, but on the 15th I have a terribly important deadline. You want to make it later. I'm, I'm much ready. not much later, but not exactly. Uh, you know, it would be a, for me personally a little awkward to meet before 15th of February. Oh, all right. Well, then okay. 16th or 17th would be fine for me. But then we have to have the agreement that that meeting is going to be the meeting when we really finalize the draft. All right. Because we've got almost no time between then and March 1st. If you if you want to do if you want to meet the 16th and 17th, I can do that. I can nail that right now. Something in my calendar on 19th and 20th of January. What's that? Sunday and Monday. No, we're, we're in February. F in February. February. And the, the, the 20th is uh, President's Day. So okay. that Monday so is yes. federal holiday. Yeah. yeah. And a Monday I would and probably it's not a good day. But this so fifth. Is that, do you have it in your so calendar? So what, what? 16th and 17th would be fine. I also had a 19th and 20th of January on my calendar. Is that now gone? Yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, long gone. Okay. So, we a proposal on the table for meeting on the 16th and 17th? Mm hmm. Two days sufficient? Yes. I'd say play, let's play it safe and go for three days. Yeah, I'd like, um, I'd like that idea as well. well so, but that, that, means, that means the 15th, then, Andreas. That means, that, we mean, that means the 15th. Can't do that the 15th. Deadline. Yeah. Or like, unless you want to. Uh, I got. I've got a. I've got something on that Saturday. And sa on Saturday, I have a family obligation. <coughs> Why don't we do ninth? Could I guess I could travel on the 14th. Could? For the 15th and 16th? Anybody object to that? No. I was just asking what do, you, what do you see in your minds in terms of the agenda? I mean, going through more of the specific chemicals that we've done or in, in the re well, hof or Hopefully, we could, by mail, we could complete these kinds of summary recommendations so that that meeting in February would really be weaving that the final document together. So, so what do you want to meet on the 15th and 16th? <coughs> 16th, 15th, 16th, and 17th? 17th, yeah. Of February. So 15th, 16th, and 17th. Anybody object to that? With a conference call on the 19th of December? December. On the 15th, I'll come down in the morning. OK. Uh, can I? Can I request something? I'm uh, getting, uh, I know what I have to do, I think, uh, 
I, I, at the very least, I have to write the DINP stuff. But uh, in regard to all the other other assignments, I'm a little confused. Can can I call upon uh, Bernie and uh, Phil to maybe make a list, or with the help of Mike, uh, to give us clear writing assignments? Mm -hmm. Yes, that'd be great. Yeah. So. Yeah. Will do. Have a good train ride back. Yes. Yes. Are we going to address the issues of the substitution chemicals where there are some toxicology data but no exposure data? Right now, or well, we're we're certainly going to address all of them at some point, and and but using hopefully is, this template. But we don't have a we haven't gone through that sort of case evaluation. Right, I know. Um, is that something we can do together before we depart? Um, I'm not sure. Who's writing what about all of that? But I wouldn't have the faintest idea how to do. Well, that. I'm not leaving for 45 minutes, so we can we can try one right now. Okay. We're going to try one of what? The uh, substitutes. Do you have one in mind you'd like to try? No, I mean, I don't, I don't know much about the substitutes. I know we, we haven't been, we don't have biomonitoring data for the substitutes. I'm looking through your sections. There are some toxicology data on them. Yep. Um, but without information about exposure, what's to be done? Okay, let's see here. Okay. Okay. Uh, we could do DEHA. Well, why don't we for fun discuss DINCH? Hmm? DINCH. DINCH. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's wait for Mike to come back and we'll do Dinge. But but that's actually a different case because that's where we don't even have toxicology data on that, right? We know nothing about. But there are there are some substitutes that have some toxicology data. I'm seeing there's, some there's with a two no generations. ALs of like 11 and 15 milligrams per kilogram. There's a two gen two gen study. Don't we need a prototype now where we do not have the data? I mean, we've we've played through various scenarios now with with chemicals where they say, let's say limited data were available, but right. let's, the one, well, I, there's really I not think much. If, I don't know if we have time to go through both of those scenarios, but I think one where there's evidence that there is some toxicity but no exposure, and one where we just don't know anything. Maybe that's asking for too much. Looking, I'm just looking at um, under tab seven, summarized on the back on page 44. There's some with not applicable. And then there's some with no AL estimates that are 11, 5. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's sorry, there's not. 
11, 16. But I don't see Dench there. Is this just an early version? Yeah, Dench, uh, there's no developmental talks. I don't know about repo. The HA, there, there is a developmental talk study. Dinch, there's no developmental talks. HT, there are a couple of developmental talks. It may not matter which one we choose. I mean, you guys can just. Substitute one. No. Oh. I think I was looking for. I have data on all of them. You want one or where there's no data on anything? No data pH. Other phthalates, DMP. So there's sort of two issues, one where we have some toxicology data, no exposure, and, and there may be cases where we have no toxicology data, no exposure. No exposure it, data, not no exposure. Are there data to show that there is no exposure or are there no data? I don't think that um, these guys did exposure modeling on these chemicals. As far as I know, we've seen the, the chemicals in the exposure modeling. I don't know of any biomonitoring data that have the chemicals. So, supposed. I mean, for example, DPHP is that the one we want to speak about? Look through the substitutes, and from what I have in my part of the report, there are animal data for every one of those substitutes. So then I went back and looked at the other unregulated phthalates, and DPHP is an example where there are no human studies that I had for review, and there were no published animal studies available for review. So that would at least be an example where we have no animal or human data. And for the developmental tox, it's just brief report and At this point, then, is, are, is it the matter of sort of comparing it structurally to chemicals that we know something about? Hard, it's hard to say. I think we just have to pick one and, and work it through and see what, see what happens. Okay, so T, DP.
So Mike, we've been talking about what would a review look like for recommendations on a chemical in which there are no data. Right. We have tentatively arrived at DPHP. I do the productive. So we're talking about DPHP, and <clears throat> from the standpoint of animal reproductive data, there are no published animal studies that were available for review. There was a summary of a preliminary report of a 90-day dietary subchronic study in rats that was available from Union Carbide, 1997. And this was a letter from Union Carbide to US EPA regarding this chemical. In a subchronic feeding study in rats, it was submitted under Tosca, and there's an EPA document and an NTIS document. But this is, I remind you that it's a summary of a preliminary report. And that seems like a pretty long reach to find some information. And it wasn't they reported a significant reduction in sperm velocity indices with an N of six rats per group. And there were some other factors associated with sperm function and concentration, like total sperm, static count, percent modal, modal count, et cetera, that were not affected, nor was this endpoint reported in other studies. Further, males had a 23% 20 decrease in body weight, spermatic endpoints there for, in my opinion, were of questionable value. So this, this was a broader study, not one looking at the specific question that we've been addressing, but it's a 90-day it's a talk study, which in general are a pretty thorough evaluation, but does not include the kinds of measures that, that we would, nor, would we, we would be looking for specifically in addressing the question of anti-androgenic activity. So that this is a, this is not a final report of a study, and it's only a summary of a preliminary report. So my suggestion is that I wouldn't, put, I would not put a lot of weight on this study conclude that there were effects or no effects because it's it's kind of a translation of a translation of a study that wasn't specifically designed for what we're looking for it doesn't mean the study is unimportant but it, I'm, I don't know how much it helps us and there were no other published studies yeah in terms of the, the developmental there was a um, brief report of preliminary results by BASF in 2003 of a gestational exposure study of DPHP in rats. And they didn't, from what they reported, and I won't go through it, there was nothing that, uh, of use to us. Um, and then there was a, a study uh, in critical review for toxicology by Fabian, in 2006, reported a screening developmental toxicity study. I'm not sure what a screening developmental toxicity study is, in which pregnant dams were treated with DPHP, but it was gestational days 6 to 15, so they missed the critical window. So again, no, and there was no maternal or fetal effects at the high dose of 1,000 milligrams per kilogram per day, but again, they, when you 
expect to see what we would be looking for. So, um, Well, most likely that was what we would refer to as a range finding study. It's a preliminary study to find out if if the effect seen in a preliminary study is significant enough to warrant doing a definitive study. And if it is, then you've already done the, the range finding study to find out the dose levels that you might use for that definitive study. Okay. But again, it was it was done at it at it time and development that was not appropriate for what we would want. So when we get down to experimental design, we would make comments. Is there any indication of um, hazard or toxicology studies on other endpoints besides reproductive and developmental? I know you haven't looked for that, but do we have any? Inf They, they showed you know, high dose females had increased post implantation loss, but again, that was associated with with maternal toxicity. So, by what you'd expect. I'm just looking at the the um, guidelines from the WHO IPCS um, report on cumulative risk guidelines, and they're suggesting as a tier zero analysis, you know, in the case of lack of data, that it would be okay to use. Um, I mean, they're they're focusing on hazard indices for grouping chemicals together, but they're saying it's okay, you know, at this very first level to even combine things across sort of non-comparable reference doses or points of departures. Um, but it sounds like we don't even have that kind of information. Um. The current method in human biomonitoring, you see EPH P exposure in the same area as you see DIDP exposure. EPH P is a C10 phthalate. So, in a sense, it is. A DIDP, but only C10. So we see 
the structures in biomonitoring studies. So all biomonitoring studies, also the ones from the CDC that measured the carboxylated um, monoester of uh, EIDP would see the mono the carboxylated monoester of dipropyl heptal phthalate. 